so we're at the 2011 International Maine's Genetics Conference here in St. Charles, Illinois, and I'm here with Juan Phillips, who is a uh, Regents Professor Emeritus at the University of Minnesota. Hi, Ron, thanks for taking a moment to talk with us. Pleasure. So, uh, Ron gave a very interesting talk last night about serendipity and science and chance and things that uh, you don't expect and uh, are very fortuitous. And one of the things that you talked about, something that uh, we only recently learned about, we're talking a little bit about on the blog, and that was uh, the maze of edition movements. Um, can you tell us about what those are and how they, how they were made? So we wanted to use a technique that could give us a high frequency of uh, lines of hope that could be used directly as varieties. And we knew about work in the UK by Lorian Bennett where they crossed wheat by corn. Those crosses did not survive unless you rescued the embryo at an early stage and put it on an artificial medium. So we decided to try that technique with oats, crossing oats by corn and rescuing the embryo after short time of development, and it turned out that we could get plants, and when we looked at those plants, they indeed were plants that could be used uh, more or less directly in varietal development. But as we looked further, we found that uh, when you cross the oak by corn, uh, sometimes you get the um, egg cell from the oak and the pollen from the corn, and they would join together to form a normal hybrid cell. However, the corn chromosomes that would be eliminated. And if they were all eliminated, then you had the, what could be used as a instant variety. But what we found and didn't expect was that uh, sometimes, about a third of the time, you'd have a corn chromosome left behind. So you'd have the complement of chromosomes from the oats uh, plus one or more chromosomes from corn. If you had one or two chromosomes from corn, you could get seed back. And so we pursued that, and uh, over time we're able to produce uh, lines of oats that had every single chromosome of corn added one at a time. So this is a very unusual thing. The, the cross is the widest cross that's ever been made, I think, in plants, I think oats and maize. Uh, but at any rate, the plants look largely like oats, and we could use them and study them and turned out to provide us a system for locating genes of corn that was uh, very efficient, and so we pursued that. Um, and this was a, an uh, unexpected development. Uh, it took some uh, research and technology to, to prove oh, yeah. that we actually had the corn chromosomes there. But we were able to do that and able to get uh, lines that were very true for all the old chromosomes and um, the corn chromosome that was added. So this then uh, not only provides a way of locating genes of corn, but ultimately will uh, probably lead to examples where there's traits from corn introduced into oat in this manner. And there are some very important differences uh, in terms of photosynthetic uh, pathways between the two species, and we, we think we can improve oats or other species of that nature, such as wheat, uh, by this technique in, in the end. However, uh, that's not proven at this time. So, you can do a lot of transfer of corn genes into oat by uh, genetic engineering techniques, uh, and this has been done. Uh, this is a process that uses normal crossing, uh, between two species, like you don't cross anything. Uh, so the question comes up, is this a genetically engineered uh, kind of progeny, or is it uh, just normal uh, sexual progeny? Um, it obviously is for normal sexual crosses, but the fact is you end up with uh, old plants that uh, have corn chromosomes. We uh, also could break those corn chromosomes through radiation and, and have uh, oat plants with just small pieces of the corn chromosome. So we puzzled as to just how we should consider this material. Should we be very careful in releasing it into fields or what? And so we decided in the end not to take it to the field until we had the 
reason to do that. And uh, by that time, they hoped it would have so many years of experience with it that uh, we know what we were doing. Uh, but it raises the question and kind of blurs the lines between what is genetic engineering and what is normal plant breeding. Uh, clearly, uh, this kind of technology will develop as time goes on. And uh, we'll have even more examples where those lines are blurred. Uh, so even, even without these examples, the genetically engineered material, uh, when it is released, is stable. And the genes that are incorporated are incorporated and, and inherited like any other gene in, in a normal plant. So the lines are sort of blurred to start with, but it makes it even more obvious when you have a technology like this. And I think one of the experiments you were talking about that you were able to do, you mentioned with the uh, radiation, that you were able to get some of those pieces of the foreign chromosome to attach to some of the oak chromosomes, so then it was, you could eventually, if you did enough of this, you could get maybe a few genes you wanted onto an oak chromosome and get rid of the rest. And That's right. Uh, it turns out that oak has a very complex uh, inheritance uh, background, and its evolutionary background and can tolerate the radiation. So you can irradiate these materials and it'll break up the corn chromosome uh, that's there. Uh, probably also breaks the oak chromosomes, but it's so well buffered that it doesn't uh, affect things much. So we can generate lines in that have uh, small segments of uh, corn chromosome left. And a lot of times these are uh, translocated over to the oak chromosome. So you have an oak chromosome with a piece of corn chromosome on it that would carry you know, relatively fewer genes. And uh, these are inherited uh, very regularly. And uh, so it's possible to screen those materials for interesting traits that you might want to bring over, uh, such as resistance to disease. And we have made some of those tests that haven't gotten any, anything particularly positive yet. But it's uh, early in the game. And uh, I think these lines that have just pieces of the corn chromosome in them will be uh, valuable to screen for various uh, characteristics. Are there any neat and interesting traits that you found from some of these? Like, uh, I've seen a couple of pictures, but I mean, you probably got a much closer look. Yeah. Well, we've, we've screened for uh, downy mildew resistance and uh, crown rust resistance. Haven't found anything particularly strong yet. Um, the, we've done some work with the uh, photosynthetic pathway, um, looking at uh, some of the key genes uh, that are involved in that, and even though we have uh, some positive trends that are significant uh, statistically, uh, they're, they're not significant from a practical point of view at this point, So, but we really haven't done that much. Our goal has been to generate these lines for the community uh, and generate as many of these uh, lines with small segments as possible. So we were funded uh, by USDA and uh, NSF, uh, and our goal really was to produce the materials that then could be used uh, by other people. We shared the materials probably with 70 or so labs around the world at this point, and uh, they're publicly available, and uh, we hope uh, they'll be a rich resource for the future. So uh, has anybody, anybody been able to get genes from the other direction, like to move? Oak chromosomes in the maze? Yeah, as far as I know, there hasn't been a lot of work across the making it across in the other direction. Uh, but what has been done apparently hasn't been successful at this, this point in time. So that would be interesting to have the capability to do it, that's for sure. Well, thank you. This is all very interesting. We're pretty excited about this, especially as, it, as you were talking about it, um, it is another one of those techniques that falls in the little gray area and how we make our simple definitions of you know, what is a, you know, breeding, what is genetic engineering, what is, you know, what is this? <laughs> it's an addition. I think that's, I think that's right. <laughs> and, uh, as we learn more about the genome and uh, what genes are important for different functions, we'll have more issues like this come up, if you want to call it an issue. Um, but you do have to be careful on all these things and consider them like I do know that uh, there are some people in the population that's allergic to corn. So if you have oats with a corn uh, piece in it, you should know whether it's got any allergenic problems or not. And so this
this whole area of allergenicity, I think, is, uh, is an important one for the future for us in plant breeding and plant genetics to get a better handle on it and be able to screen for it uh, more easily and so on so that uh, we can avoid those rare circumstances when someone is allergic to it. And uh, there's someone allergic to almost anything, of course. But we do take our chances when we travel internationally. We eat foods that a lot of times we don't even know what it is. Uh, but uh, occasionally there's a problem. And so these are things we have to watch out for uh, so that we produce uh, products that are safe and, and uh, a technology that uh, the public uh, trusts. I think we could also say as plant geneticists, we're still trying to figure out what it is that we're eating. You know, we've got a conference full of hundreds of many geneticists in there. We still don't know everything about this one plant amongst many plants. That's right. We haven't emphasized the nutritional aspects of our crops nearly as much as we will in the future, I think. And of course, a lot of it comes down to economics. Um, society has to be willing to pay for that better nutrition. And that has been real obvious. And although things are changing rapidly, I think in the future uh, we'll certainly uh, have a much more uh, emphasis on the goals of improving the nutrition of our crop plants, uh, which can have a tremendous impact around the world. Uh, you know, people, uh, half the world eats rice, and the rice is deficient in uh, pro-vitamin A, or what we call beta-carotene. And so they estimate about a half a million kids go blind every year due to vitamin A deficiency. If we can improve our crops, particularly the rice, uh, for vitamin A or pro-vitamin A, uh, that can have a tremendous impact on the health of the kids and and others uh, who have their immune uh, system compromised by lack of vitamin One of the other things I really liked about your talk last night was you were directing it toward all the young uh, scientists and the students. Is there something you'd like to say to uh, any budding young scientist that might be watching? Well, I think uh, we as scientists have a lot of value. So they may appear to other people as small values, but they're extremely important to us, such as having integrity that you can never break. Um, but I think uh, you're right that I was directing it toward the uh, younger people in the audience, but it's a, it's a good reminder to everybody. And uh, there are issues that come up with uh, established scientists that, uh, that you know better, and so you need to uh, keep your values and uh, trust uh, at a very high level to do good science, and I think I was trying to say that to everybody, but, uh, but mainly I was uh, trying to direct it toward the younger people, and uh, it was delightful the first time when we had the people stand up, and it was at this meeting for the first time, and it was a very large contingent of people. So uh, I think having some of those principles in mind uh, helped you through your career. Thank you very much, Ron.